Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tim Bruns, and I am the Associate Editor of Roads and Bridges Media. On behalf of Roads and Bridges Media and our sponsor, Mapai, I would like to welcome you to today's presentation titled, Benefits of Bridge Strengthening Using Fiber Reinforced Polymer System. The fiber reinforced polymer composite materials used for decades in the aerospace industry are now being used to strengthen existing concrete structures. The use of these materials as external reinforcement for concrete structures has become the preferred method of strengthening over more traditional techniques like section enlargement, external post tensioning, and steel plate bonding. Whether used to increase the load bearing capacity of a structure to restore loss of capacity from damage or deterioration, seismic retrofit, or blast hardening, the MAPRAP FRP strengthening system offers a simple cost-effective method to address structural deficiencies. This presentation will introduce the unique characteristics of FRP materials, the various components of the MAPRAP FRP system, and general design considerations and limitations. Several case studies will be covered examining corroded bridges, structurally deficient bridges, and the general repair of bridges. Attendees will leave with a greater understanding of which materials should be specified for particular applications, the advantages and limitations of FRP versus traditional strengthening techniques, available design guidelines and codes, and engineering assistance available from Mapai Corporation. Over the course of this presentation, viewers will learn introduction to fiber reinforced polymer materials, design principles, advantages, and limitations of FRP materials, suitable bridge applications for FRP systems, and case studies and resources. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes, but first, a little housekeeping. You will notice on your viewer that you have the ability to ask questions. We encourage you to ask questions, and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation based on time availability. Any questions we do not get to, we will answer offline. Our presenter today is Brian Stratman. Brian is the Business Development Leader for Corrosion and Structural Strengthening with Mapai Corporation. Brian's work experience includes structural design of commercial and retail structures, territory sales manager for power and industrial concrete repairs and grouting, business development manager for steel piling, fiber reinforced polymer strengthening, and corrosion mitigation. In his current role, Brian is responsible for business development and engineering support related to Mapai's structural strengthening and corrosion product lines. He has over a decade of experience related to the design and installation of FRP strengthening systems for concrete and masonry structures, and is also a NACE certified cathodic protection technician. Brian is also an active member of the ACI 440 Strengthening Committee and ICRI Strengthening and Corrosion Committees. Now I will turn it over to our presenter to begin the presentation. Brian, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, not sure where everyone's uh, signing in from, but I'll jump right into it here since we're on a little bit of a shorter time frame than I'm, than I'm used to for this. But um, as we said, uh, we're going to talk about uh, FRP systems today, um, the, the MAPAI MAPARAP FR, FRP system specifically, um, as it applies to bridges. Uh, these materials get used for all sorts of concrete, timber, steel uh, structures that are out there, but obviously road and bridges. We're going to we're going to be talking mostly about bridges today, um, using FRP to strengthen bridges uh, for the various applications. So. Um, we'll start out just kind of going over a kind of brief introduction to strengthening. Um, I'll kind of go over the, the different types of FRP systems that are available out there on the different options that you have, um, some of the support services that, that are available to you, and then uh, just in closing, just some case studies, just give you an idea of some of the projects that are out there um, that have been done uh, so you get an idea of, of where you might use these materials uh, in the future, hopefully. So. Um, as we as we move forward, um, you know, why are we talking about strengthening structures? There's really um, really four main categories for for why we get into this situation. The first, uh, you know, as it pertains to a bridge, um, for some reason we have to increase that load bearing capacity. It could be you know a change in the traffic class uh, of the bridge. Um, sometimes when you're out in rural areas, you get these really old you know 60, 70 year old bridges that they had no idea there was going to be these big 18 wheeler Semi trucks rolling over all day, um, so you've got to get you know up to the modernized uh, load, you know H20 loading, et cetera. Um, so you maybe don't have a bridge that meets that, and you need to get up to that level of strengthening. Um, 
and then there's of course design and construction errors. So I mean, as, as an engineer myself, and we don't want to admit it, but certainly we do. You know, we make we make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. So sometimes you just miss something or underdesign something, and you've got to correct that. Uh, you know, later down the road, um, when it starts to crack and, and exhibit itself as an issue. Um, and also the contractor. Um, you know, they they make mistakes too. They're moving pretty quick on tight time schedules, oftentimes. Uh, trying to get done in the construction season, so so sometimes they maybe will miss a bar or two somewhere, or forget to put the shear stirrups in a in a beam, uh, things like that, and you've got to come back and correct that after the fact. So um, that's that's really one of the more common things we run into. And then certainly second, probably or equal to that, would be the second category there, which is um, uh, replacing capacity that we've lost either uh, to some sort of damage or deterioration. So this could be you know, the big one, obviously, is, is corrosion of the steel in the bridge. Um, I live up in Cleveland, Ohio. We're dumping road salt on our bridges all year. Not all year, fortunately, but it feels like it sometimes. Um, but a good chunk of the year, we're dumping a lot of road salt onto our bridges. Um, as, the, as the cracks form and the water takes it down to the steel, we get corrosion, a lot of loss of strength. That picture on the, actually on the lower right there of that big bridge column that's just obviously raining concrete. Um, it's actually a very large highway bridge here in Cleveland um, where they've had the rope uh, fence off the whole area because there's just giant uh, chunks of concrete falling off of that thing from corrosion of that steel, as you can see. Um, there's a bridge right next to it. As the snowplow goes by, it's just throwing all that snow and salt spray all over the bridge. And it uh, obviously has very bad results for the bridge. Um, then there's, you know, cut or damage reinforcing steel. Um, this is more... Um, typical of the building industry, but sometimes you might run into it um, with plumbing on a bridge where the, the contractor's out there and they want to run a pipe through the beam and they always seem to find the absolute worst part of the, the beam that they can cut the hole through. Um, so they'll cut some of the reinforcing steel and obviously that causes a loss of strength. So we have to come in and fix that. Um, another, you know, big one that I, I really can't believe how often it happens, but uh, impact damage from trucks. Um, Seems to happen almost every day somewhere. You get a truck driving down the road and they have a, a big backhoe or something on the back and they don't lower the, the crane or the boom down low enough and it hits a bridge. Um, we had one, we had a pedestrian bridge here in Cleveland several years ago get completely knocked over. Um, it's just a you know smaller pedestrian bridge, but the, the force of the impact knocked the entire bridge over. Uh, we just had a, a highway sign get hit uh, just a couple of weeks ago where there was a fatality, unfortunately. Um, but this happens quite a bit. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure how you think they pay more attention to that, but what happens is the truck will, you know, hit the bridge, crack the beam, do some damage, and you've got to get out there and, and fix that as quickly as possible to keep traffic going over the bridge um, so we can, we can get out there and strengthen for that. And then fire or other natural disasters could obviously damage, uh, you know, damage a structure, be it a fire, be it a, uh, a, an earthquake out on the West Coast. Um, severe flooding, whatever it may be, you get damage to structures, and we've got to get in there and, and fix that. So um, the third category there, uh, seismic performance, that's a real big one on the West Coast. That's really where these materials got their start, um, was just improved uh, ductility of the member um, by wrapping typically around, uh, you know, around columns. You really improve the ductility of columns, uh, be it a bridge column, building column, whatever. Um, so seismic is a big Big area of strengthening and then not so much uh, but blast resistance um, certainly comes up here and there um, probably not so much on bridges but um, it is an issue uh, that does come up here and there um, so some of the typical strengthening applications for bridges that we'll run into um, this first picture we see here that's just a typical ashto girder um, it's getting shear stirrups installed externally. Um, we call these U wraps in the FRP world because it's basically you're just wrapping around the member like a U. Um, and so the idea is that you're just replacing or supplementing the shear stirrups that are in the member, either they've corroded or maybe they're missing some, whatever the issue may be. Um, you need to add some shear strength to the member so we can go ahead and wrap uh, externally around that member to, to add some additional shear capacity to the, to the bridge or to the member, whatever it may be. Um, column wraps, um, there's a number of different reasons um, that we might do this. You can see you know, each of these members, you can see it's got a carbon fiber wrap in this particular case. Um, sometimes this is done for strengthening. Um, maybe they've, they've lost some, uh, some of the capacity due to corrosion or uh, just deterioration, whatever the cause may be. 
Um, uh, sometimes it's done just for simple corrosion protection. They want to put uh, just a layer of glass around the, the member just to, you know, help keep salts and chlorides from, from getting into the concrete. Um, we're seeing quite a bit of that um, more and more these days. Um, lots of different, different reasons, but uh, column wraps are certainly uh, one of the more common things that we'll see done on bridges, uh, certainly here, here up north and, and out west and, and really anywhere in the, in the U.S. or Canada for that matter. Um, and then flexural uh, deck strengthening. So um, what we're looking at here, um, this was actually, uh, actually more of a parking structure, but there's a, like an elevated roadway. We'll see some better pictures of it later. Um, but there's an elevated roadway coming in. And again, you're our old friend corrosion showing its head. All the cars coming in with the salt starts dripping off onto the road, um, works its way in, causes deterioration of that steel. So we lose strength and we've got to add some back. Um, so in this case, they used our uh, carboplate material, which is a, a pre-cured FRP kind of uh, thing. It's like a plastic plate um, where they just place it on the bottom of the deck, um, and that's giving an additional flexural capacity in between the supports. So um, certainly something we could do on, uh, on any bridge, or it could be an issue on, on any bridge, and you can come in and use FRP materials to provide that additional capacity. Um, and then this. This last picture, this is actually in a parking garage, but I just wanted to give a, a more close-up picture of just a column strengthening. Um, you know, here you can see you might be doing on the top, they've got a corbel strengthening where the bearing's happening just to provide some additional confinement, help kind of maybe hold hold any concrete repairs that were done, or if you've got cracking and falling, wrapping it, holding it together like that helps. Um, and then they're also doing some flexural strengthening, actually, of the columns. They're running material vertically up the up the column. Um, to simulate longitudinal bars that would be running up that column to provide some additional bending capacity um, to the column. So lots of different applications. Um, there's certainly more than I'm, than I'm showing here. I just want to give you kind of a, a, you know, a brief overview um, of some of the different applications that you'll run into. Um, so I keep saying FRP, but what exactly is FRP? Um, so that stands for fiber reinforced polymers. Um, and really that sounds fairly complicated, but it's not. Um, really all that means is we have some sort of a fiber and that is encapsulated in some sort of a polymer. Um, in the case of the materials that we're talking about today, uh, we'll go through which the different types of fibers are, carbon, glass, et cetera. Um, but for the polymer material, we're almost exclusively using epoxy. So um, you'll have various epoxy materials that encapsulate the fibers. You want to saturate it completely. As you can see on the right there, you want to get that's a, a you know microscopic shot of all the little fibers. Each one of those fibers that you see, the little round circles, that's about one twentieth the size of a piece of human hair. Um, each little individual carbon fiber, so it's very, very, very small, very, very, very light. Um, and then you need to get the epoxy to kind of work its way inside and around those fibers to completely encapsulate and saturate. Um, so we're creating a you know a, a basically a plastic plate when it dries cured. Um, with the fabrics anyhow. Um, so pretty simple concept. Um, and then, the, of course, the epoxy, the polymer is used to bond, and, you know, in addition to saturating and encapsulating, it's also the material that's bonding to the concrete. Um, so it's really important, you know, surface prep, um, you know, and ensuring good bond of the material is, is critical when we're installing FRP systems. Um, so, you know, where did these materials come from? Um, you know, Traditionally, um, really, the, is, is mostly NASA and you know space space programs around the world um, was where these materials first kind of were discovered um, due to their you know extreme high cost. They weren't really applicable to anybody else. Um, governments with their large budgets were able to kind of do research and find these. Um, but we're starting to see them more and more. Um, you know, in these composite materials, you know, the Boeing Dreamliner um, is completely made out of FRP materials. Um, there, you know, there's no metal in that entire hull, in, you know, in the hull of the aircraft. Obviously, the engines and stuff, things like that, have some metal to them. But you know, the wings, the fuselage, everything is completely made out of the same the same fibers, frankly, that we're that we're using to strengthen, um, you know, these bridges. So um, you're seeing them there on on the higher end. And then uh, you know, if, if anyone's into you know outdoor sports, if you're a golfer, a snowboarder, a biker, hockey player. Um, you know, why are our hockey sticks costing $200 or do we, why do we got to pay, you know, $500 for that new driver every year that we're hoping uh, will straighten our, our shot out for us? Um, it's because they're using FRP materials uh, for those products. And, and it's, again, it's the same benefit 
for for those sports that we're using them for for uh, construction. They're they're very lightweight. They're very uh, flexible. Very very strong. Um, so they have all the all the properties that we need. Um, they just come at a little bit of at of a higher cost uh, on the front end uh, than you know some, than so, certainly some of the more traditional materials that we're used to working with. Um, just general composites and other areas of construction. Um, today we're talking about FRP materials as they pertain to strengthening. Um, but just to give you uh, an idea of some of the other areas that you might see them, um, we're starting to see more and more uh, composite materials being used, in, certainly in the bridge world. Um, so uh, composite bridge decks, you'll get FRP bridge decks instead of a, a metal pan deck that's going to corrode and rust and have all those problems. They're starting to come out with fiberglass, formed uh, you know composite decking uh, that you can you can place in in lieu of that metal decking that's going it's obviously it's not going to corrode it's going to last much much longer um, there's some code issues around this uh, some of the, the building codes the astro code etc they don't necessarily allow for uh, some of these materials to be used on a, on a public structure but if it's a private bridge we're starting to see certainly more and more and, and the codes are moving towards allowing using these materials. It's just uh, you know, anyone that's involved in that process, it takes a long time um, to get things like this added uh, to the code. So I would expect in the next probably 10 to 15 years that, that we'll be fully immersed into the codes and be seeing more and more of this. Um, then uh, thirdly here, uh, just like the, instead of a welded wire mesh, um, they're using carbon fiber mesh. Um, in place of that, again, the, it just all goes back to corrosion. Any, any place in the bridge that we can take corrosion out of the equation is going to be an advantage. So um, you'll see that being used as well. And then there's actually FRP bars as well, um, which we'll talk about today. Um, but we, we are only talking about it in kind of the uh, idea of localized strengthening. Um, but there's actually bridges out there um, that are completely built with FRP bars. So there's no steel rebar in the bridge. Um, it'll all be either carbon or glass uh, FRP bar. Um, different manufacturers, uh, we, don't, we don't really get involved in that ourselves, but um, there's certainly, um, certainly a lot of, uh, of uh, manufacturers going uh, pushing these systems and, and they're getting used. Um, again, there's code issues with this, um, so it's more on the private bridge market right now, but you'll, you'll probably start seeing more and more of this as we go through the next decade or so, um, just because they're going to last, the, the performance of these materials is so much better than steel. Um, so just getting into, you know, where, what we're talking about today, strengthening itself, there's, there's three types of fibers that are typically used in these materials that, for external strengthening, um, carbon, glass, and aramid. Aramid, you probably know better as Kevlar. Um, you're really not going to see that material being used very often. Um, it's really very, very hard to work with. It's very expensive also. Um, but, you know, and it's really only good for like a really high end like blast application. So if you were, you know, trying to upgrade a, a government building or something against a bomb, you might use that material. So we're really going to be talking about just carbon fiber and glass. Um, so with that um, carbon fiber um, i would say we're probably using carbon fiber 80 80 to 90 percent of the time it's, it's really the the go-to material um, for strengthening um, the reason that we are using carbon fiber um, more so than the glass is that it's very very strong um, very very high stiffness um, which relative to what it is the glass is is also um, Uh, also very uh, very strong uh, for its size, but it's it's just not as durable um, as as the carbon. So we we don't really use it as much uh, for strengthening applications. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but the carbon is very very durable, very very long lasting, great endurance to to uh, constant loading. Um, really, the only issue with carbon is that it is conductive. So um, you do need to make sure that you don't have it in contact with other uh, metals. Um, so if you have like, um, imagine like a bridge bearing plate and you're doing a shear strengthening, you want to make sure you don't get any contact between that metal uh, bearing plate and the carbon because you'll actually force corrosion of the bearing plate due to, uh, you know, diff different, uh, different metals being in contact with one another that actually causes the corrosion cell to form. So. Um, in those cases, um, we just got to be careful. We can use the epoxy 
um, to uh, act as a barrier or we can use glass because uh, the glass is not conductive. Um, so we could use glass for those. The, the problem with glass, which is also, as I said, very high strength, um, you know, for what it is, it's, uh, you know, these materials are about as thick as it really is a piece of paper, um, maybe a little, you know, a little bit more than that, but um, they're very, very thin. Um, so the strength they're getting out of even the glass is tremendous. Um, but it's, it just doesn't have the durability. Um, it's got much lower endurance than the carbon. So like you know, if you're constantly loading glass, it's going to stretch out a lot quicker than the carbon. Um, it actually can kind of rupture on you a little uh, prematurely. Uh, so we typically try to limit glass to when we're doing like a single event strengthening. So that would be, um, you know, a seismic strengthening where you're just planning for an earthquake. Um, it's just going to, you know, you're going to have the earthquake. Uh, there might be some aftershocks, but, you know, all of the whole event's going to take place in a matter of minutes. And then we can go out and inspect the structures afterwards to see what kind of damage there is if we need to do any, you know, repair at that point. Um, it's not something like a flexural strengthening on the underside of a bridge deck where it's just constantly every day, 24 seven being put under constant load. Um, it's basically just sitting there waiting for the one event to happen. Um, another thing that we see a lot of, uh, DOTs are in particular using glass for is just a, it's just almost like a basic protective, uh, sheath around columns. Um, so like I said, here in Ohio, you know, and certainly all other Northern northern places where we got, you know, snow plows driving down the road. Um, they almost always, if they're doing bridge work here in Ohio in particular, they'll just specify to throw a layer of glass around all the columns just as a, just as a kind of a belt and suspenders approach. It's not very expensive. Uh, the glass is relatively cheap. Um, so it's, you know, it just adds life to that, to that member. They don't have to go out and re, uh, do concrete repairs quite as often because it's, it's wrapped and protected. Um, so they're really just using it as, as almost like a sacrificial layer, um, if you will. Um, and it's, it's, it's glass is great for that. Uh, so we do see a lot of that as well. Um, column wraps, that's, that's what you see there on the right. Um, this picture, uh, you'll see there's like a double column there. So the, the, the column that's wrapped on the left um, is right, really almost adjacent to a column right uh, to the right of it. So I just wanted to show there that, you know, the space, you know, you only really need, if you can fit a paint roller into the space, then you have enough room to install these systems. So it's a really, really versatile material, allows you to get into really confined tight spaces. Um, it's very lightweight, so you don't need heavy machinery. All the, all the installation tools are, are handheld, um, you know, up to and including some of the surface prep, because they're usually just using angle grinders for that. Um, so, again, a very versatile material, lots of different things you can, you can do with it. Um, there's different types of systems, as I mentioned. So we have the, the map wrap fabric system. Um, so these are, these are actually carbon fabrics. Um, they're, they're flexible. As you can see there, they come rolled up. Um, they're going to be either carbon or glass. Um, and then they come in what we call either uniaxial or bidirectional. So uh, what we mean there is the, the, the roll of carbon or the glass is, is comprised of a whole bunch of fibers, as I mentioned before. Um, when we say uniaxial, that means all the fibers are running the length of the of the roll. So um, you see that ruler in the picture there, um, sticking out kind of on the by the by the paint tray and the bottom of the where the, the roll terminates. All the fibers are running, you know, parallel with that with that uh, that ruler um, in a uniaxial sheet. Um, in a biaxial or bidirectional sheet you'll actually have fibers also running perpendicular to that ruler. So you'll have a zero and a 90 degree, um, zero and 90 degree uh, direction of the fibers. You'll also sometimes see 40 uh, plus or minus 45. Uh, it just depends, it varies with the manufacturer, how they make it. Um, but the idea there is to just get, um, you know, strengthening and reinforcement going in different directions. A lot of times uh, over shear cracks, engineers will prefer that. Um, but um, those, you know, it just varies by project, which, which material uh, is going to be needed. And certainly uh, varies with engineers, what they prefer. Um, some prefer uh, one material over another. Um, but these, these systems get applied with the proprietary system of epoxy. So, you know, the mapper app system, we have our own whole system of epoxies and our competitors, they have their own whole set of epoxies. You don't want to mix and match. You don't want to use our fabric with uh, one of our competitors epoxies. 
Uh, you should always be using our fabric with our epoxies. And if you're using one of our competitors' fabrics, you should be using their epoxies because um, they're all designed uh, to work together as a system. So um, even though they're separate products sold separately, they're all really working together. Um, but really with the fabric, it's just the versatility. Um, when you need to turn corners, uh, you know, for like that U-wrap I showed around the ash toe beam or wrapping around a column, um, a rigid plate isn't going to turn a 90-degree corner. Um, so you have to use the fabric for those types of situations. Um, and other situations where you might have, um, for example, that, that, uh, that elevated um, parking deck entrance that I showed before, where you're doing, say, a flexural strengthening or maybe a shear wall strengthening or a retaining wall strengthening where you really just need to install the material only flat. Uh, there's a different type of product um, we call our carboplate uh, system, but these in the industry are, are referred to as laminates. Uh, so these are pre-cured laminates. Um, it's typically only carbon. You won't see the glass um, with these types of products. Um, they come in a roll, uh, like you see in that picture there, uh, but that's under extremely high tension. Um, it'll actually have little straps tied around it. Um, we recommend that the contractor actually build a box around the uh, coil before they cut the straps because it's going to want to literally explode uh, into a flat condition when you cut those straps. So um, you got to be careful um, when you are, uh, you know, undoing the packaging. Um, but the contractors really prefer these uh, materials for any kind of flat application. Um, it's because, as we'll see, it's it's much quicker on the install side. It's you know it's much less work for them. Um, they basically just put one epoxy on the back of that uh, plate and stick it up, and they're done. Um, whereas with the fabric, it's a much more involved process, as we'll see here in a second. Um, and lastly, there are uh, what we call the Maparad bars. I talked briefly uh, earlier about these bars. Um, we have carbon and glass bars. Um, what we're doing with these bars is not building entire structures. We're doing little localized repairs. Um, uh, you'll see a lot on like a bridge where you have kind of a cantilevered section. Um, a lot of times like the sidewalk will be cantilevered off, off the side of the bridge. Um, so you have a negative moment uh, area on the top of the bridge there. Um, if you get some, a lot, any kind of corrosion or deterioration and you need to add strength, um, you probably don't want to have uh, a sheet of carbon or a, a, a pre-cured plate you know, on top of that sidewalk or on top of the drive lane, uh, whatever it may be, because the, the vehicles or the pedestrians are going to, are going to one, they're going to damage it, and two, for a pedestrian or even a vehicle, it could be slippery, um, it could be a safety hazard. So um, what we use the bars for is actually do an internal kind of strengthening, which we call a near surface mounted uh, strengthening, which I'll show more about here uh, shortly. Um, but the the installation procedure for, for the fabric systems, when we're wrapping, uh, you know, around when we got to turn corners, um, the first thing we got to do is we use a primer. Um, so you prime the substrate with an epoxy primer. Um, then there's a second uh, epoxy that's a putty. Um, that's And this is the steps. Um, we're starting here and going up through the process. Um, on the left-hand side, you see that step sample there. Um, so the mapper at primer one, that's the first step. So you prime the bare concrete. Um, and that's just to get a good, you know, tenacious, good bond uh, to the bare concrete after you've done your surface prep. Then the, the map wrap 11 or the 12, the putty material that uh, everybody always has, uh, some sort of a putty material, um, where they are um, just basically you're leveling out this uh, structure. Remember, that these materials are being bonded to the concrete. So if it's, you know, if it's really rough and you got a bunch of bug holes or uh, little concrete repairs that need to be made, you can't just bridge those areas and expect the material to stay bonded. You have to have a nice, smooth, flat surface to bond the, the FRP to. So we use the, the MapRep 11, 12 putty um, to flat, basically to smooth out, flatten, level the, the concrete uh, before we place the fabric onto it, uh, onto the substrate. Then there's a, uh, a base coat of saturant that gets applied. So that's this map wrap 21 or 31 you see there on the left of the step sample. Um, that's a third epoxy. Um, there's different ones, whether you're doing wet layup, dry layup, um, high temperature, low temperature, um, thick inversions. There's, there's all sorts of different versions of this, but the idea is that it's going to saturate and encapsulate the fabric. Um, so you put a base coat of that onto the substrate and then you place the dry fabric into that wet epoxy that you just placed onto the substrate, kind of place it by hand. The fabric will stick and hang pretty well. 
Um, then you come back over that with what, what I call a ribbed roller. It's basically like a smooth drum roller, um, and then it has little kind of ribs in it. So if you can imagine uh, almost a bunch of little spikes sticking out, um, the idea of it is you roll it along the length of the fibers. It spreads the fibers apart, allows the epoxy to bleed through uh, the fabric material. And remember, we really want to completely encapsulate all those little fibers that make up the fabric sheet. Um, so it's really important to roll really hard until you start seeing the epoxy bleed through uh, the carbon sheet. Then you come back over top of that with uh, a second top coat of that MapRap 21 or 31 saturating epoxy resin. Um, and that's that's the process for one layer. Um, and then if you were going to do successive layers, which sometimes we will certainly do, um, then you just do basically steps three through six again. You don't have to reprime and, and re-level. Once you're under the fabric, you're just adding more, more of the saturating epoxy and more fabric. Um, being that we're talking about bridges and we're outside, um, these are epoxy materials and epoxies are not UV stable materials. Um, so we do have to coat them. Um, so the final step, once you have all the layers on, would be to use a breathable coating. Um, we have several available, um, but really, um, you know, any, any, you know, acrylic type coating or uh, aliphatic urethanes are preferred as well um, to, to provide that UV stability for the epoxy once, you know, once, uh, once everything's installed and dried, um, that would be the final step in, in this uh, installation process. Um, so again, um, we have several different fabrics available, um, and these are pretty typical across the industry. So the, the most common that you'll run into are our MapRap C Uniax 300 and 600. Um, the 300 and the 600, that's the weight of the fabric in uh, metric units, so that's grams per square meter. Um, so what we see is the one fabric is just twice as heavy as the other. The 600 is like two layers of the 300. So if you get in a situation where you, you know, you do your calculations and we need four layers of the 300 material, that would be dumb. Let's just use two layers of the 600. Um, so you'll see that most manufacturers have, you know, similar. Uh, in U.S. units, that works out to the 300 is nine ounces per square yard and 600 is 18 ounces per square yard uh, would be the weight of the dry fabric. Um, then we also have some what I call kind of specialty applications because we really don't see these as much. Um, we have a, a 1200 weight fabric, which would be like four layers of the 300. I find it's really hard to work with, so I'm not a big fan of, the, of something that heavy weight. Um, and of course, we have our Biax carbon and glass uh, fabrics. Um, and then we also even have a Quadriax um, that we really don't use much here in the U.S., but um, that has 090 and plus minus 45. Um, so there's a lot of different fabrics out there uh, for different applications um, that you'll run into. Um, for as far as the glass goes, we have our, our traditional Uniax glass. That's what's getting used for most of these projects. Um, again, the 900 is the weight. Um, so that's pretty typical of what you'll see in the industry for glass. It's 27 ounces per square yard. Um, pretty much all the manufacturers are using that same weight. Um, so it's pretty, you know, pretty consistent across across the board, uh, whether you're using ours or someone else's uh, uh, glass fabric. The glass fabrics are always white. Um, you'll see they have this white color to them, uh, whereas the carbon is usually black. Um, and then, of course, we have the biaxial as well for the glass, uh, should, there, should there be a need for that. Um, but just to, send, just to kind of go through the epoxies again, um, so there's is the primer, that's the first step in the process. So you apply the primer to the bare concrete after you've done your surface prep. Um, these are all usually three part, or I'm sorry, two component epoxies that are mostly three to one, uh, uh, part A to part B, uh, by, by weight or by volume, it depends on the manufacturer really. Um, same, with, same with the putties, the, the map wrap 11 and 12. Again, these are for the leveling of the concrete before you, before you apply the FRP material. Um, and then you have your saturating resins, the 21 and the 31. So it's it's really three different epoxies that you have to work with to install the fabric. So it's, it sounds like a lot, but it's it's fairly simple. We do train all the contractors um, if they need um, need training. Typically, uh, the specifications for these projects will require the contractor to have prior experience. Um, but if they don't, we can certainly get out and train them on how to properly do that. Um, just to show you some of the, the material properties for the carbon. Um, 
you can see here, um, so the thickness of the 300 is 0 0.02 inches, so just two hundredths of an inch thick per layer, very, 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 very thin, and that's, that's the cured thickness with the epoxy. Um, so you're not adding much to your, to your substrate or to your, to your column, whatever. It's very, very low profile. Um, then the 600 is just twice as thick. You have twice as much fabric, so that makes sense. Um, now you'll see the, the tensile strength and the modulus are more or less the same. Um, that's because we're using the same carbon fibers for each of these. Um, so when you're comparing fabrics, you have to multiply the thickness times these values to get the actual um, you know, design value for that product. So when we do that, the 600 will have twice the tensile strength and twice the modulus of the, the lower, uh, lower weight 300. Okay, so that's the fabrics. Um, so then the carbo plates, again, these are more for your flexural strengthenings um, or, you know, just kind of bending situations and whether it be at a wall or a bridge substructure, um, could be the underside of a big beam. Um, if you have bending issues in an ashto girder, certainly you could use plates as well. Um, but you'll see it's a much quicker process. You cut, you cut the piece, you need a 10-foot piece, you cut a 10-foot piece. Um, our material comes with a peel ply on each side uh, that keeps it clean right up until you're ready to install it. Um, not all the uh, competitive systems on the market have that. Um, so w when they don't have that, you actually have to solvent wipe the whole thing clean before you install it. Um, so having this little piece of peel ply on there is really advantageous to the contractor because when they're ready to install it, they just pull that off. They know it's nice and clean, and they just proceed without having to wipe it down. It saves a lot of time, a lot of money. Um, and then you just apply adhesive to the, to the uh, clean plate. And then you place that uh, adhesive uh, covered plate up against the substrate, press it down like you see on, on the picture there. And usually they'll take like a drum roll or just to roll along and make sure everything's nice and smooth and tight. And then you're done. Um, so it's a much, much faster, quicker, easier process that the contractors certainly like a lot more than having to do a primer and, a, and leveling putty and the saturant. Um, when it works, but it's just not right for every job. Obviously, if you're doing a column or you're doing a shear strengthening of, a, of an astroger, you can't use these products. So um, they don't work for that. They come in different widths, two, four, six. Uh, we can get special orders as well. Um, they come in uh, basically five hundredths of an inch thick, uh, a little bit variance there. Um, you can get them cut to length for additional charges if you need. Um, we can get special modulus if we need. We can get custom widths. Um, when you do do that, just bear in mind that's a special order item, so you're going to have lead times associated with that as well. Um, but really the only epoxies you need, sometimes we require primer with the plates, sometimes we don't. Um, so you may or may not need primer. It just depends on the kind of condition of the substrate, kind of go job by job with that. Um, and then map or wrap 11 or 12, that's the adhesive. That's the same material we use. Um, for leveling the concrete with the fabric, um, but just in this case, we're just using it as an adhesive uh, to adhere that plate um, to the to the concrete. Um, then just quickly with the, the Maparad bar. Um, so remember I was talking about, you know, those bridge rails where you kind of get like a, a cantilevered sidewalk over the edge where you maybe you want to have the, some sort of an internal strength thing. This is a little trick we can do with the bars. Um, you see there's a little detail on the left. You can see they do a little saw cut, um, about one and a half times the diameter of the bar. Uh, so it's usually a number three or number four bar, uh, just to give you an idea of size. So you're usually around a half an inch saw cut um, depth and width. Um, then you just put some epoxy into the saw cut and drop the bar in, and then, uh, then you're done. So you have an internal strengthening that you can add kind of after the fact. Um, not something we do a lot of, but it's just, uh, you know, something that can come up. Um, it's certainly a, a very uh, useful tool if you need it. Um, so, yeah, they come uh, 5 sixteenths and 3 uh, three eighths, uh, typically for the for the carbon bars, usually uh, 7 and 20 foot lengths are the, just the stock lengths that they come in. And, again, we can cut those if need be. Um, you can lap them as well, um, just like you would lap steel bars if you have a longer, if you have a big, you know, 60 foot run and you need to uh, do something like that. That would be that would be pretty uncommon for how we use these products, but um, you can do it if you need to. Um, then there's there's glass bars as well. Um, then lastly, I haven't really talked about these yet, um, but there's also what we call FRP anchors. Um, so these help. Um, kind of improve the overall capacity of the system. Right now, the codes 
gastro code and the ACI 440 code don't give any guidance on, you know, how much actual extra strength you're getting, but um, that's going to be changing here soon. Um, they're trying the next edition, the 440 is going to have um, different uh, strain equations depending on whether it's anchored or unanchored. Um, and that's going to be really great because up until now, it's just kind of been, well, you know, the manufacturer can tell you whatever you're getting, which is really not a good way of doing anything. Um, but what these are, they're like a, it's like a carbon fiber rope. Um, it comes in like a really long, you know, 20 foot long or so rope of carbon. Um, then you can cut them, as you see, into these smaller little pieces and kind of splay the one end. Um, so what we do with these is, you know, in this, in this case, they're going to be turning that inside corner down from the wall onto the slab. Um, so they want to, they want to hold that back. Um, so what they do is just drill a little hole, vacuum the dust out, put some epoxy onto the rope, um, which you can see doing there on the splayed ends and then also on the, on the end that's not splayed. Um, insert that into the hole. Um, you can see he's doing it here through a, a piece of carbon fabric. Um, and then you basically just splay out those fibers, you know, 360 degrees around uh, the drilled hole or, you know, if, if you only have, you know, 180 degrees, that's fine too. Um, we just try and get them out as much as we can. And so basically what you're doing is you're pinning back the FRP to help improve the bond of the system, which in theory would in increase the strength of the system. Um, so that's basically more or less uh, the different systems that are out there. I didn't, uh, unfortunately, didn't have time to get too much into, you know, some of the, the design stuff. So if there's any engineers, um, you certainly follow up with me if you want to you know, get more information on, on, you know, some of the design uh, techniques and equations and things like that. I didn't want to, I didn't want to get too bogged down in that. Uh, we'd run too long with the, with our time allotment. Um, but we do offer uh, engineering support services for these products. Um, we can give you uh, design calculations, uh, telling you, you know, how many how many layers of the material you're going to need, you know, at what length, at what you know, what distance off of the column lines, et cetera, uh, spacing, basically everything. Uh, it's going to be a shop drawing, essentially, uh, telling telling the contractor everything that they would need to know to install the system, to bid, to bid the project, whatever. Um, we would be working with the structural engineer of record, um, so we do not do analysis. We won't go out and do a load rating on a bridge to determine what, you know, capacity it has. Like we don't, we don't get involved with that at all. Um, we also don't get involved with determining how much additional capacity the bridge needs. Um, we're only talking about the design of our actual product. So the engineer would come to us and say, I have this, this Ashto girder and it's deficient in shear by 20 kips. Uh, you know, how much how much of your material do I need to install to give me that 20 kips? That's the engineering that we're talking about. We'll do that design, um, you know, and work with the engineer. Um, we do a lot of or equal designs where maybe a competitive product is specified and you, you'd like to know, hey, they're, they're saying use this much of this product, you know, what, what which of your products would you use? We do that. Um, sometimes we'll just get load information. That's pretty common with DOTs, uh, you know, with uh, state and federally funded projects. They don't like to have like a sole spec, so they'll just kind of specify, you know, basic load requirements, minimum load uh, information. Um, so there's different ways of doing it. Um, and again, I won't get too into the weeds with that, but, uh, you know, if you are an engineer and you'd like more information on that or your contractor that bids a lot um, and would like to speak to me about that, um, just you know, put a put a note in the questions uh, to follow up with you, and we can certainly do that. Um, we we do uh, seminars, lunch and learns, all that. I know with, with COVID going on, that's kind of turned all that upside down on its head. But um, you know, we can we can do something similar to this for you as well. Um, you know, it's just an online type seminar right now. Uh, depending where you live, we can send the uh, the local sales rep in. But I'm not really trying to get on airplanes and come see you right now, unfortunately. So we're, we're doing more uh, web-based stuff at the, for the time being. Um, and we also do applicator training. I think I mentioned that before. So pretty much all of the FRP specs are going to require that the applicator have been trained in how to use these products. It's, it's not super complicated, honestly. If you've ever messed around with putting up wallpaper, that's actually a lot harder than, than putting this uh, type of product up. Um, but it's very similar. Um, you're just, you know, you're just wetting it out. Uh, wetting out the concrete and placing fabric and, and wetting out the fabric. So what we'll do in this training is we'll, we'll show them how to properly mix it. Uh, we will show them 
uh, you know, some of the uh, quality control stuff, you know, as far as I know, I saw a question up there about pull-off testing. So it's pretty common uh, for the specs to require they verify uh, 200 PSI of pull-off strength because, um, again, these are bonded systems, so you want to make sure they're bonded. Um, so really the only quality control that, that we're able to do is the bond test. So we'll go over, you know, how to do bond testing, size of size of the puck, uh, epoxies to use, um, how, to, how to properly, you know, all, all the ins and outs of doing that, um, how to handle the material, how to, you know, just, just a general troubleshooting. It's usually like a three, four hour, uh, half a day that we spend with the contractor going through, um, you know, all the various things that they would need to know uh, to install it. And then we can write them a letter saying, that, yeah, they're a, a trained contractor uh, with the mapper app system uh, and then we do provide the shop drawings I'm sorry I'm going to jump back here on the right um, these are just the shop drawings so we would also issue uh, uh, drawings um, that again would show all that information there it's basically a shop drawing um, we will not stamp these drawings so um, when they uh, they often will require stamps and we work with third-party engineers um, when that's required um, but again, that's something I can get more into um, if you have an interest in that. Just uh, follow up with me uh, in the in the questions, and I can and I can reach out to you. Um, then we do we have calculations available as well. Um, we have uh, Excel calculations, and we also have uh, MathCAD calculations. I I personally I prefer the MathCAD uh, ones that I built because it shows all of the math. Um, again, I'm an engineer, so I'm definitely a little bit of a nerd like that. But I, you know when it, the problem with Excel is it just shows an input and an output. It doesn't show you where all the math is happening. Um, so it's kind of hard to catch if there's any issues. Um, but we do make these available if you're an engineer and you'd like to design it yourself. Um, we could certainly provide this to you or you're welcome to just give us work with us and let us do that, do that legwork for you as well. Um, but there's, there's calculations available for flexural strengthening, shear strengthening, column confinement. Um, and we can really build them for any type of specialty uh, application that might come up as well. Um, only to give these out to engineers, though. It's not something we want contractors running around trying to design stuff. Uh, no offense, but you shouldn't really be doing that. Um, so if you're an engineer and, you, and you'd like to uh, get a copy, certainly just reach out to me and, and be happy to do that for you. Um, but again, um, we'll, you know, we'll provide the shop drawings. It's just going to—it's just more of a blown-up version. This you can see here. There's the U-wraps. Uh, so we show the spacing of the U-wraps. Um, if you have a flexural strip, those are those. The, the, there's one on the top there across column line one, and then a, a positive bending out in the middle there with the eight foot diameter uh, carbo plate on the on the bottom. Uh, so we'll show the length, the distance off the column line again. Just it, it's a general shop drawing. It's just going to show them everything they need to know uh, to install that material properly. Um, and that gets sent out again in a, in a submittal package usually. Um, Again, that usually gets stamped, so we'll send that to a third-party engineer um, and uh, get that stamped when need be. Um, so just again, to go over that, we won't stamp it. And then the structural engineer of record, you know, they've got to provide all the background stuff. So the section dimensions, concrete compressor strength, is existing capacity, ultimate required capacity, um, extents locations that require strengthening, all the background stuff. We're, we're not structural engineers. Yeah, I, I am, but we don't, you know, Mapay Corporation is not a structural engineer, so we're not going to do that work for you. Um, we're just talking again about engineering of our product. Um, so kind of running up on the end of the time here, so I'm just going to go through these uh, case studies real quickly. i um, just kind of give you a, a better idea of some of the real world types of applications that, that are out there. Um, so this was a big project in Montreal, Quebec. Um, it's the main bridge that accesses the island, um, and they had some pretty uh, significant shear issues. The, the funny thing about this project is I think it might now be torn down. Now, all this work was done about six or seven years ago. Um, the, the bridge was just in such bad shape that they were really worried about it, it making it until they, they were building a brand new one right next to it, but they were so worried about it that they spent you know, millions and millions of dollars um, ensuring that it would get, you know, get them to the point where they could open the new bridge. Um, so it's kind of interesting, but uh, just the shear strengthening of the astro girders, uh, pretty typical uh, astro girder shear strengthening project um, up, you know, up over the river uh, accessing Montreal. Uh, certainly, certainly something that we see a lot of. Um, and then, so this matrix uh, corporate center, this was the one, uh, the, 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 it's kind of like a parking garage with the elevated kind of bridge entrance that I was telling you about. Um, so 
So it's a, it's a really big office campus, uh, 2,700 square foot, uh, or 2,700 space, excuse me, uh, parking garage attached to the office building. Like most of these private office buildings, they, they did very little maintenance on the roadways and on the parking garage over the years. Um, this is again is in Connecticut where they get a lot of snow, so we're doing the road salt thing. So of course they got a lot of corrosion um, uh, in the steel and the precast deck panels that it was built out of. Um, so they needed to provide some flexural capacity back to these members. Um, so they literally installed several miles worth of our four inch wide plate system. Again, the plate's usually better for these flat applications. Um, just installed on the underside of, of the ramps, ramp entrances, bridges coming in. Um, to replace that, that strength that they lost due to the corrosion of the reinforcement steel. Uh, another Connecticut project, uh, this was a bridge, um, just basic column confinement. Again, um, a lot of the DOTs are doing a lot of this, just, just going out to wrap. Um, maybe it's corroding, maybe they just have a lot of spalling, or maybe there's even a concern with some of the uh, axial capacity of the column. Uh, but for whatever reason, they just want to wrap the column. Um, so they'll come out and just wrap horizontally around the column and it provides, uh, you know, additional ductility. It provides some confinement pressure, holds it all together. Um, really just a good kind of belt and suspenders longevity, um, you know, add some life to your bridge structure repair. Um, this one here is just a glass. Again, this is another belt and suspenders. This is an ODOT bridge here in Ohio. Uh, pretty significant uh, spalling, as you can see on the right there, uh, due to corrosion. Um, they weren't so much worried about uh, providing strength um, because they felt they still had adequate strength, but they wanted to, they, there was a significant amount of repair. Um, so they were really just looking to kind of help hold those repairs in place. Um, so they, they decided to use glass. This is something ODOT does actually a lot of. Um, and they'll just cover the whole thing in glass as they can, just a kind of a sacrificial layer uh, to help prevent uh, any damage. Um, same bridge again, that's, you know, that's the same column I showed you before. Um, they actually did some uh, carbon as well. There's some flexural strengthening. Um, so you don't always use carboplate for flexural strengthening. You may occasionally use the fabric. Um, it does happen. Um, it just kind of depends. Um, you can only get so much strength out of the plates because you can't stack them into, into layers like you can with the fabric. So um, you do use uh, all the fabric sometimes on flat applications as well. Uh, so that's just, uh, you know, a couple of those are the ones you see. I mean, really, it's, it's flexural shear and confinement are really what we're talking about. And then seismic strengthening, if you're, you know, in the seismic areas, those are really the, the main applications that you'll use these products for. Um, just uh, lastly, just some additional resources for you. Um, there's two, I guess, design guidelines. They're not really codes. They're, they're really more uh, just, just guide specs, design guides um, from ACI. Uh, and ASHTO. ASHTO has the design of bonded FRP systems for repair uh, that you see on the left-hand side there. Um, that's starting to get specified more and more by the DOTs as it's getting, you know, it, it, as you can see, it's been out since 2012. Um, but, you know, as I said, things kind of take time. Um, a lot of the specs have been deferring to this other one on the right, the ACI 440. Um, but you know, you're seeing more and more DOTs uh, start specifying the ASHTO uh, requirements for FRP as well. So um, both are good documents. Uh, they have all the information you would need to design the materials, uh, install the materials, quality control, all, all of those different things. Um, if you're up in Canada, they have the CSA F06 for bridges. Uh, then the 806 is specific to buildings. And then the 807 is just the specifications. So, um, and then globally around the world, there's, you know, all sorts of, different, you know, Japan has one, England has one, but they really all read pretty much the same. Um, just take, you know, different parts of the world do things a little bit differently, but for the most part, it's all the same. So with that, uh, I will take any questions that we may have. Uh, yeah, thanks so much, Brian, for that great present. Oh. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was just going to mention, I put my, uh, my phone sure. email up there for anyone if they want to reach out to me, feel free. Go ahead, Tim. Yeah, thanks again, Brian, for your, your great presentation. We'll now take uh, just a few minutes we have left here to take some questions from the audience. Um, so the first one uh, I'm seeing here asks, are there any techniques for reestablishing shear capacity in adjacent box beams using FRP? 
and or are there any for reestablishing the load distribution that is provided by transverse post-tensioning in adjacent box beam sections? Um, so that's a good question. <laughs> Meaty one to start with. Um, when you're talking about adjacent beams using FRP, it, it gets a little tricky because you have um, you have that break between the beams. Um, so you, you, the, the material needs to be constantly bonded all the way across or that, that break point in between the adjacent beams is really going to become a weak section in the bond. Um, so probably need to spend more time, you know, thinking about that and, and, and talking to you more about your specific question. But just on the surface of it, it doesn't sound like that's probably something you could do. Um, typically, you're, you're limited to just one member. Uh, with the FRP, when you start moving into multiple members and different different deflections and things, it gets it gets too much for the bond. Um, but um, I, I could circle back with you after, and we can discuss it in, in more detail if, if you'd like. Um, can get, get a better feel for what you're looking at doing on that one. So the next question we have asks: um, Epoxies are sensitive to pH. Uh, since slag is more commonplace, do you have materials to correct high pH? Um, uh, I'm not sure I understand this question in reference to, uh, so if you have high P, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think they're saying if you have high pH concrete, do we have something that will lower the pH that is also part of the FRP? I yeah, know um, we don't have anything like that. Um, but we don't really have, I will say, I mean, we don't really have any pH requirements tied to our epoxies that I'm aware of. Um, I, I don't think, I mean, concrete naturally in place concrete is going to get, I, I'd, I'd be shocked to see an, uh, an old concrete that has a high pH of 12 to 14 that doesn't have some sort of chemical attack happening um, because the carbonation of the concrete is going to lower it down to probably, you know, seven, eight or nine over time. Um, so we usually haven't, that hasn't come up uh, as an issue for us. Um, but I would say, no, we, we certainly don't have something that we can place that's going to lower the pH of, of the concrete. We know nothing like that. Okay. I think we have time for one last question here for now. Uh, how is the repair length determined for FRP used to restore moment capacity in a pre-stressed box beam? Um, so that's a good question. So typically, um, you know, you'll have a deficiency uh, that the structural engineer will, will run their analysis of that box beam and they'll determine that, uh, you know, it's deficient from, say, the, the eight foot mark to the to the 20 foot mark, but it's good everywhere else. Um, so they would then work with us or whichever, you know, manufacturer, whoever they're working with. And they say, yeah, you know, so from eight feet to 20 feet, we have this deficiency. Um, you know, where, where should we use the FRP? Um, the development length of FRP is, is only like four to six inches per layer. Um, so, if, you know, if you have one layer of material, you can fully develop the load in just four to six inches of the bond. Um, that throws most engineers for a loop because they're used to, you know, the three, four, five foot lap lengths of, of rebar. Um, but generally, yeah, you would just, you know, you do your, your load testing, um, you know, however or you go about doing that and determine where your deficiency is. And then once we know where the deficiency is, we'll just extend a few feet beyond that in either side just to fully develop the load uh, beyond that on each side. Okay, great. Thanks so much again, Brian, for your presentation and for answering some of those questions. Um, that wraps up our time for this webinar. Any questions we were unable to address will be answered offline. On behalf of Roads and Bridges Media and our sponsor of today's webinar, Mapai, I would like to thank everyone for their participation. This webinar will soon be archived at the same URL you used, to, you used today, available on demand, as well as at www.roadsbridges.com. Stay well and stay safe, everyone.